Well, it's been a while since I've been here with you, and uh, I've had uh, some interesting health issues that have gone on. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about what has happened to me and, and how I'm doing and what the Lord is doing and where we're at. Uh, just to start with, I'm Pastor again, David Pickett, and I pastor Grace Family Fellowship that meets in Burleson. We meet at 1 p.m. at 1600 South Burleson Boulevard. It's a Hilltop Church of Christ building. About two months ago, I had suffered from a small stroke, which is called a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. Uh, and then here recently, I had another one about three weeks ago, uh, which brought me back to the hospital. Uh, definitely a scary time as you're going through health issues and you're wondering what in the world is going on and, and what the future may hold. We uh, prayed for different you know, things as we were in the hospital, wondering what was going on as they started to do the carotid angiogram that was going to tell us whether or not I had any kind of blockage. Um, we started praying to the Lord that He would make sure that nothing was there, that I would be found to be healthy. So as I'm laying there and they're doing the procedure, the doctor looks at me and says, Now, why did you have the stroke? Uh, I responded, Well, isn't that what you're here to tell me? And uh, what they saw there in the carotid artery was that there wasn't anything that could have been a blockage or would have caused anything um, like a stroke. Uh, I do have some health issues I deal with, uh, type 2 diabetes and blood pressure, but even with all that at my age, uh, it shouldn't have been anything that brought me to the position I was in. Uh, the MRI um, and and then the following tests show that I have four blockages in the back of my brain even right now as we speak. Uh, this is called severe arterial deterioration. Uh, so besides the blood thinners, there is not much that they say they can do at this moment with it. I still have several tests to go, uh, different doctors to see and, and a few more opinions to get to see what we can do to help with the situation. Um, and the last visit that I had at the hospital, uh, the doctor uh, told me, uh, you're overdoing it. Now when the doctor comes in the first time, their instruction is to take it easy. And I'm certain that I haven't shared this with you, but besides being a pastor, I work in the field of construction. Uh, out in the heat that we have here in Texas is definitely a stressful situation. And trying to continue to keep up with the work and all that heat can definitely be a trial. So he tells me that I need to keep at a walking pace and to stay out of the heat and be in heat no hotter than 90 degrees. So because of that it definitely takes away uh, the summer months that you have in construction to be able to get something done. And I find myself wondering what in the world is happening? What in the world is God doing? And at times you can definitely feel abandoned as you wonder uh, what the future may hold. Uh, my family has been great rallying around, giving support and encouragement. But it definitely does create an interesting issue when stress levels go up, when heat goes up. I uh, feel like I can feel my pulse up in my head. It makes it hard to think through. Uh, I get a lot more accomplished in morning hours. Uh, while things are cool and stress levels are low but as stress builds up it definitely becomes something that is difficult and so as I go through all the things that I'm faced with as I look at what life is about to be uh, enjoying the fact that I'm able to be here with you sharing the word I definitely feel a lot better as I share the word uh, and that is definitely uh, an encouragement but when you stop and look at the other things that happen uh, when you stop and look at children continuing to grow and activities that they go to, uh, there are things that you can't make. Uh, there are things that are, may stress you beyond what your physical limitations can be. And, and it's hard to not be a little fearful. And it's hard to uh, not wonder what tomorrow may hold and how that's all going to work. 
And I just wanted to share with you all is, as I look at that, where I think God is in, in that for me and that for the rest of us, when life falls apart, uh, what do we hold on to? Uh, definitely had some comments from those people who were helping and and caring for me in the hospital. Uh, my family is definitely one that enjoys cutting up and laughing and not taking life so seriously that we all have uh, ulcers over it. So as nurses and caretakers were coming in and out, uh, cracking jokes and telling stories and definitely being a part of the work environment there was something that they weren't necessarily familiar with. Somebody's just had a stroke. They expected everybody to be upset. And yet because of the promises we receive from God and because of what we know him to be, we can definitely view it from a different point of view. Not to say that there wasn't any fear there and there wasn't any worry. Uh, my wife was a trooper. She always smiled as she was there with me. But I know that when she went home, she definitely had to deal with the emotions of what was happening with me. And so when you deal with those emotions, what do we look to? Who is God then? What promises do we hold on to? I really appreciate the prayer said in Ephesians 3 and verse 14. It's definitely a prayer that encourages me, that shows me exactly where I am and who I am. So if you'll open your Bibles with me to Ephesians 3 and verse 14. Uh, this is the New Century Version that I believe that I'm reading from here. So I bow in prayer before the Lord, from whom every family in heaven and on earth gets its true name. Just to know that my name is received from the Lord, is received from heaven, is definitely an encouragement that I'm not here on anything other than his will verse 16 I asked the father in his great glory to give you the power to be strong inwardly through his spirit and I pray that Christ will live in your hearts by faith and that your life will be strong in love and be built on love definitely something that you go through as you wonder what health will be will be giving you that love is what we have and I pray that you and all God's holy people will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love I think that's just such a important part of the verse that we could have a capacity to understand the greatness Imagine love, imagine the best way to feel love, the best way that somebody could communicate love to you. Apply that to who our Savior Jesus is and realize that that idea, that sharing is beyond anything we could even imagine. It's just incredible. The greatness of Christ's love, how wide, how long, how high, how deep that love is. Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know. But I pray that you will be able to know that love and that you can be filled with the fullness of God. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything that we can ask or imagine. To give Him, to Him be glory in the church and in G Christ Jesus for all time forever and ever. Amen. I just think the prayer is so beautiful. It's so appropriate for us almost on a daily basis. Because as we go through our daily routine, we definitely run into trials, problems, issues that make life seem like the day set out wrong, that, that somebody didn't care, that you know, as I look at what happened by this person or that person, there's no way that I feel that I am valued today. There's no way that people love me because look at who I am and look at what I'm going through. And when you read this prayer, when you look to recognize not only in the prayer that we're looking for love, but that the love was already there before we looked, it definitely is an encouragement. It definitely is something that gives us hope. 
it definitely helps us get through our day. So when, when I deal with the fear of what's tomorrow going to bring, how am I going to be a father to three ch children where construction and what I know as far as income is almost removed for me. I can't say all of it is removed, but it definitely takes me out of the position I was in looking for other ways to continue to provide for them. In Romans 8 and verse 15, we read that the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Well, I know that before the stroke, I felt that the love of God was something that I was predestined to preach, that something that connected with me in a dramatic way. It's what fueled my fire. It's what I got up every morning to do was to share that love. And if you ever get around me or I'm around my family they'll know that there'll be that moment where I'll be preaching I'll be sharing that love when your life all of a sudden turns upside down when you don't know what health will give you tomorrow there is that chance for fear I have shed my tears wondering what the future may hold but here in this scripture I definitely find encouragement because God doesn't want me to live in that fear again. The Spirit doesn't want me to be a slave to it. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. See, here's what we want to look at when life starts bringing the troubles and the trials. The Spirit we received didn't bring us back to fear. It brought us to the understanding of how God views us and how we are sons and daughters, that his son paid that price that we are adopted into the family. And it's by him, by Jesus, that we cry, Abba, Father. Well, imagine the children around Jerusalem playing, crying, Abba. It's not a formal call, Father. It's not a bowed head and, and a surrendered knee to the ground. Abba is daddy. Abba is here I come running, pick me up. I need your touch. I need your hug. I need the relationship uh, that we have in you. And I definitely think that uh, as Christians that's what we need to continually remember as life definitely throws us a sucker punch, as life definitely goes a direction we hadn't seen coming that uh, we are in the arms of our daddy, that he is caring and taking care of us, and that we are not alone, and that we are not being set out to dry and, and hung out to dry, that we can rely on everything that God has given us as our father, as our daddy. Another passage that I enjoy reading that just encourages me again about who he is and the love he holds for us is in 1 John 4. 1 John 4 and verse 7. Dear friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become God's child and knows God. Once again, we see here that we are adopted that there is sonship, that there is definitely a family going on. We are not on the outside looking in. We are on the inside a part of who God is. In verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, I don't like using this scripture to beat people up, and I've heard people, well, you don't love me, and you don't. We're all still human. We all still have our human side exposed. We can't beat people up with it. What it means is, if there's somebody whose life continually displays the lack of love, we may have to have a conversation. But it doesn't mean at moments where our humanity rises its ugly head that we condemn everybody with it. In verse 9, this is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we could have life through him. This is what real love is. It is not our love for God. 
and I think that's a critical part of this section of verses. It is not that we love God. We never love God first. It is that God's love for us came first, that he sent his son to die in our place to take away our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us that much, we should also love each other. And I think this is the critical part that we can really gain some insight into what our daily walk looks like. It's not because the people around us love us that we show and express that love to others. It's because God loved us that we express that love that he's shown to others. Those others might not be the people that we communicate and hang out with every day, but there are definitely people in our lives that need to know that they're loved and might not experience that except from somebody who understands that God has loved them. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is made perfect in us. We know that we live in God and that he lives in us because he gave us his spirit. We have seen and can testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God has God living inside, and that person lives in God. It's definitely interesting when we get into these passages to see how the union between Jesus and his Father is the same union that we receive as Jesus is in us, that we have the same connection, the same bond, the same family expression of love, that God is in us, lives in us, in verse 16. And so we know that the love that God has for us and that we trust in that love, God is love. Those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And this is how love is made perfect in us that we can be without fear on the day that God judges us. Did you all catch that? This is how God's love is made perfect in us, that we can be without fear. I believe that's truly what that love is about, that that's truly what God hoped Jesus Christ came to give us is not only the sonship, but our opportunity to live this life, to live a full life without fear because we know that he is there. Because God's perfect love drives out fear. It's punishment that makes a person fear. So love is not made, is not made perfect in the person who fears. We love because God loved first. If people say, I love God, but hate their brothers or sisters, they are liars. Those who do not love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And God gave us this command. Those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters. As I've said before, the passages definitely show us exactly what God's plan and hope is for us as Christians, and not only for us, but the rest of humanity, because Jesus Christ didn't limit the number that he came to save on the cross, because as my Bible says in John 3.16, that Christ came to save the world. I don't know how you guys count that number, but uh, the world means an awful lot of people to me. His love is beyond understanding. His reach is beyond our physical capacity of understanding as we read back again talking about how wide how long how high how deep that love is let's not even think that we can imagine the depth and the width and the height we can't fathom how wide that is how long that is but we definitely need to understand that as Jesus was here there was a plan there was a plan of inclusion a plan plan of sonship a plan of ad adoption into the family, that we might not just become saved and without fear of our, of our own lives, but become a part of a family which definitely had more than just saving our necks involved, that it definitely brought us to a point of realizing that as a son or a daughter that we had a bigger part in the reality of who Jesus is today. 
As Jesus left the earth, he definitely gave us some instructions and some encouragements. In John 14, John 14 and verse 27, he said to his disciples, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. If we were to imagine all the stories of Jesus, if we were to imagine watching him walk through the different things that we saw throughout the Gospels, we definitely would have seen a person of peace. We definitely would have felt that peace as he calmed the waters, as he healed the sick, as he fed the multitudes. We would have known that he wasn't worried. We would have known that there was joy. I do not give to you as the world does. And to meditate on that comment could definitely lead us into a lot of possibilities of how the world gives and why that comment was made. So he doesn't give to us like we would give to each other. So don't let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You've heard me say to you, I am going, but I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you should be happy that I am going back to the Father because he is greater than I am. I have told you this now before it happens so that when it happens, you will believe. I will not walk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming and he has no power over me, but the world must know, the world must know that I love the Father, so I do exactly what the Father told me to do. As we look at our lives, as we walk our walk with Jesus, as He leaves His peace with us, as He's commanded us to do what He has done, we have to ask ourselves, I guess the most telling question of all, because if Jesus is in us, and the Father is in us, and that love is to be expressed, and we can see the Father in the expression of that love, then here in verse 31, do we understand, can they say, do they see it, that the world must know? Let's remove Jesus out of the equation right now, and let's put the I in it. Does the world know that I love the Father? That I, that you, that that love came from Him, that He adopted you to the point where you can express that love in words, and actions beyond our own understanding because it was Jesus in us, it's the Father in us, expressing that love to brothers and sisters, adopted and included into his family, that we might not express in the proper vocal capacity as to how much God loves them. We're definitely excited about being able to share that love. It is definitely my life's love to consider and to express and to share that love and I definitely want to continue to be able to share that with you as I continue to deal with the health issues that I have I just want to thank people for their prayers and for continuing to consider us as a program as we continue on throughout the days and hoping that we can continue to encourage you in your walk that you have with the Lord.